Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, series on qualitative methodology, uh, co-sponsored by the International Institute for Qualitative Methodology, the University of Georgia, and Atlas TI. Uh, today, we have Drs. Jory Hall and Melissa Freeman from the College of Education of the University of Georgia. I'm Ricardo Contreras, and I will be moderating this session. Um, let me share with you uh, some information uh, regarding the webinar. Uh, let me first say that your microphones will be muted in order to okay. avoid echo and background noise. Uh, the presenters will speak for uh, about 40 minutes. While they are presenting, uh, you should feel free to write down your questions. Uh, if you take a look at the Go to Webinar control panel, you will notice that there is a section there that says questions. Uh, you can practice now by saying hello. You can write down hello or something like that, and I will be able to read that. So at the end of the presentation, uh, I will go ahead and read the questions that you write down, and the presenters will proceed to answer them. So with that, I would like to now ask uh, my colleague Yvette Magwat from IIQM to introduce the presenters. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Dr. Jory Hall, Associate Professor at the University of Georgia, is an interdisciplinary scholar and research methodologist. Her research focuses, focuses on applying qualitative methods and mixed methods approaches to inquiry in order to improve programs in various contexts. Her methodological research is featured in the Journal of Qualitative Inquiry, the SAGE Handbook of Mixed Methods in Social and Behavioral Research, the Oxford Handbook of Multi and Mixed Methods Research Inquiry, and the Journal of Mixed Methods Research. In addition to qualitative research and mixed methods inquiry, Dr. Hall has studied the philosophy of pragmatism and culturally responsive evaluation approaches. Because she is committed to social justice, Dr. Hall's main concern is how participants' values have been engaged responsibly. Her work on responsive evaluation approaches have, has resulted in multiple articles published in the American Journal of Evaluation. Dr. Melissa Freeman is Professor of Qualitative Research and Evaluation Methodologies at the University of Georgia. Research into different philo philosophically informed traditions examines the variety of interpretive and critical strategies researchers use to make sense of the world. Her forthcoming book, Models of Thinking for Qualitative Data Analysis, engages readers in the conceptual underpinnings of five distinct and analytical strategies used by qualitative researchers. Categorical thinking, narrative thinking, dialectical thinking, poetical thinking, and diagrammical thinking. Dr. Freeman's work is less cross-disciplinary, is cross-disciplinary, and she is committed to addressing social and educational problems in ways that contribute meaningfully to new ways of conceptualizing the role of inquiry in everyday practice. She has published articles in Qualitative Inquiry, International Journal of Qualitative Studies and Education, New Directions for Evaluation, the American Journal of Evaluation, and has a co-authored book, Researching a Children's Experience. Dr. Paul and Dr. Freeman, thank you for being with us here today. Thank you, Yvette. Uh, Dr. Hall, I will now uh, I will now share with you the uh, the presentation. You're going to be in charge. Just a second. Okay. You will see a message that will pop up. Oops. My apologies. There. There is something. Uh, okay. No. I think it worked. It's working. Okay. So let's see. Okay. Now. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. So everything works perfectly fine. Excellent. Thank you so much. So to begin, we'd just like to briefly introduce ourselves. I'm Jory Hall. As was said, I am a member of the Qualitative Research Program at the University of Georgia. And I specialize in qualitative research, program evaluation, and mixed methods inquiry. And hi, everybody. Um, I'm Melissa Freeman. Jory and I both teach classes on program evaluation as well as um, core courses in the qualitative research program here at UGA. I also, I also have uh, interest in philosophical, philosophical forms of inquiry, qualitative evaluation, and research with children. Great, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We'd now like to provide an overview of our presentation. And what we'd like to do is to begin by defining evaluation, 
culture and responsiveness. Then we'll discuss cultural responsive evaluation as a stance and a framework for evaluation. Next, we'll go over some commitments and strategies for critically for culturally responsive evaluation. And then we'll address culture via qualitative evaluation by using some examples from the field. Last, we'll consider some challenges when implementing culturally responsive evaluation approaches and offer some resources, followed by a few minutes of Q&A. So let's begin with some terms. As Joy mentioned, we're going to talk, talk about several terms here. So a big one is the difference between evaluation and research. Although the two inquiry approaches do overlap, they are usually distinguished. So imagine that you are interested in a new program meant to integrate the arts across a school's curriculum. From a researcher's perspective, the program offers numerous possibilities for generating knowledge in ways that might contribute to relevant questions within a discipline. So for example, a researcher might ask, what is the experience of learning for eighth graders when art is integrated throughout their school day? Evaluators, on the other hand, generally view their practice as helping program implementers better understand the workings and the effects of their programs. This is a form of inquiry that seeks to determine the merit, worth, quality, or value of something. Going back to the example of the art integration program, an evaluator might want to generate information that would help the program implementers understand what aspect of, a, of the program are making a difference and in what way. An evaluator might ask, for example, what aspects of the program find support from teachers, students, and parents, and which ones are resisted. Data generated through an evaluation would be analyzed with a view to sharing the findings with program stakeholders. So to recap, evaluation is typically generated by stakeholder interest, where stakeholders can be considered anyone who has a stake in a program being evaluated. That which is evaluated is also known as the evaluand. The aim of evalua evaluation is to determine the merit, worth, quality, value of some entity, program, or practice. Research, on the other hand, is typically generated by the researcher's interest for the purpose of contributing knowledge to some field. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Now, let's take a moment to discuss and explore the term culture. In 2011, the American Evaluation Association put forward a public statement on cultural competence in evaluation. This statement informs our understanding of culture. The statement also advances cultural competence, a point we will return to later in this webinar. For now, we focus on what we mean by culture. We characterize culture as shared experiences among people. These experiences include, but are not limited to, a common worldview, language, values, and customs. Cultural dimensions can also include demographic markers, such as race, ethnicity, religion, and social class. We consider contextual dimensions such as geographic region and socioeconomic circumstances as essential to shaping culture as well. Cultural groupings can also be formed around shared interests like hip hop culture or religion. In addition, we note that culture shapes people and people shape culture. A key point here is that attention to culture is needed to draw valid conclusions. Lack of attention to the complexities of culture can lead to flawed findings with potentially devastating consequences. Ultimately, attending to culture requires responsiveness. Thanks, Jory. So responsiveness, what does this term mean to us and why is it important? First, the idea of responsiveness always conveys a relationship. We respond to someone or something, so that someone or something becomes a part of our inquiry in some fundamental way. Responsiveness pushes us to deepen our receptivity and attention to the cultural and contextual dimensions of a setting or program. 
As noted in First and Hood and Hughes' chapter on conducting culturally responsive evaluations, um, and I'll read the quote that's on your slide, Culturally responsive evaluators honor the cultural context in which an evaluation takes place by bringing needed, shared life experience and understandings to the evaluation tasks at hand. So in AEA's public statement on cultural competence and evaluation, three essential components stand out in regards to becoming a culturally responsive evaluate, evaluator. First, it is important to acknowledge that no evaluations are culture free. Simply put, the idea of a neutral social science is an illusion since all designs derive from a particular perspective on the world. Second, cultural competence is not equivalent to having acquired a body of knowledge. It's rather a stance towards learning and the awareness that cultural understandings developed in one context cannot be transposed onto another, but have to be developed over, you know, over time, every time, you know, within each evaluation context. Third, therefore, a culturally responsive evaluator understands her or his work to be an ethical commitment to learning from stakeholders and with stakeholders. In a 2014 co-authored paper with Jory Hall and Kathy Rolston on right timing and formative evaluation, we argued that demonstrating cultural and contextual receptivity included being reflexive, attentive, and aware. What this means in practice is that we try to approach evaluation with a stance of openness, a willingness to revise our design, the reflexivity to rethink our assumptions, and the ability to adapt and be flexible in response to emergent issues. This requires that we believe that cultural responsiveness is a stance we take towards evaluation practice. So this quote by Hazel Simonette nicely illustrates this stance. The quote refers to our agenda as culturally responsive evaluators. Hazel notes that our first agenda item is to take an inside out perspective. This perspective recognizes that our culture shapes our role as evaluators and how we implement evaluation work. Put simply, we need to understand that evaluation is bound up with culture and context. Our second agenda item as evaluators is to take on an outside in perspective. This means going outside of ourselves to seek and develop the competencies needed to conduct culturally responsive evaluation. The varied positionalities represented in Hazel Simonette's twofold agenda are also illustrated in this diagram. This is a visual representation of cultural responsiveness as a framework. As you look closely at the diagram, note culturally responsive work is not a single method or a component that is implemented during a certain phase of the evaluation. Rather, cultural responsiveness is embedded throughout the entire evaluation context. Thanks, Jory. So for the rest of our presentation, Jory and I would draw examples from an evaluation we conducted together at a professional development school we call Synergy. A professional development school, for, for those who um, don't know about these schools, or PDS, is a partnership school usually um, developed between a university and a school. PDSs focus on, among other things, preparing new teachers, providing professional development for faculty, and engaging in inquiry meant to improve practice and support student achievement. So Synergy was such a school. The school served over 500 pre-K through fifth grade students. It was a Title I school, which meant that it received financial assistance from the government due to the high percentage of children from low-income families. Another characteristic of this particular school was that the majority of the students were Latino, while the majority of the faculty and instructional staff were white and female. So we were invited to lead an evaluation of the partnership by one of the Synergy partners because we taught research and evaluation courses at the university. With the school context in mind and after talking to multiple stakeholder groups, 
we attempted to shape an evaluation design that was responsive, a point Joy will talk about further next. But in addition, keep in mind that taking a culturally responsive stance meant that we also needed to be mindful of how larger contexts might be influencing the decisions made at this particular school. So the diagram depicted on the slide shows some of the other influences shaping synergies practices. For example, community values and politics, the professional development school standards themselves, and district, state, and national policies, just to name a few. Thanks, Melissa. Another major consideration for us given this context was the fact that the school district was already collecting a lot of quantitative data on Synergy. Things like student test scores, attendance records, and other relevant demographic data. Knowing this, and because of our own preference for qualitative and mixed methods design, we put forward a qualitative design we felt would complement the quantitative data collected by the school district. Qualitative data helped to shape our culturally responsive evaluation design in that it helped to elicit culture through thick, rich descriptions, expose program issues and inequities, and incorporate marginalized groups. So as we noted, one of the advantages of, a qual of qualitative data is that it can elicit culture through thick, rich descriptions. A well-known qualitative researcher, Robert Stake, suggests descriptions are rich if they provide a lot of interconnected details to capture some of the cultural complexity embedded in the evaluation context. And descriptions are thick if they offer connections to relevant theory or deepen our understanding of culture. In Melissa's article called The Hermeneutical Aesthetics of Thick Description, Melissa states thick, rich descriptions require the evaluator to not only detail events, but to ask, what do these descriptions mean in a particular context? Overall, thick, rich descriptions require culturally responsive evaluators to critically question what they understand as they are collecting and organizing evaluators' events, behaviors, relationships. Returning to our evaluation of the partnership, to gather thick, rich descriptions, we reviewed a number of artifacts and documents such as materials from the school district's website, school newsletters, the mission statement of Synergy, as well as notes um, from school and partnership meetings. Collecting all of these data helped our understanding of the institutional culture of the school and the character of the local community. Interviews also provided us with thick, rich descriptions. For example, conversations with Synergy teachers helped us understand the way district and state mandates often worked against desired PDS practices while conversations with parents reviewed initial concerns among the African-American parents about being rezoned into a school that was predominantly poor and Latino. Fortunately, over time, these parental concerns were dispelled because of the responsiveness of the teachers, administrators, and staff at Synergy. So documents and interviews supported by observations, which Jory will talk about next, provided us with invaluable insights, which we could not have gathered any other way. We also made sure to check our preliminary understandings, what we thought was happening, with other stakeholders and sources, providing a form of triangulation, which involves a deepening of the complexity of issues, rather than simple confirmation of one source by another. As noted by Michael Patton, qualitative inquiry can provide insights into the social environment. It does this, for example, by revealing information about the formal and informal activities and interactions and attending to verbal and nonverbal communication and things that might go unspoken. In this way, qualitative inquiry was helpful for us to expose issues and inequities. In our evaluation, observations revealed tensions in the partnership that were otherwise unspoken. We observed numerous meetings with the partnership leaders from both the university and the school district. We also observed school events. These observations illuminated a key issue 
in the partnership based on past events. Because issues between the school and the university were not handled well in the past, the partners were extremely cautious about what they said and what they did. During their meetings, they maintained a stance of respect, thus avoiding direct questioning about the purpose, the vision, and values of the partnership. Basically, the desire to not repeat past mistakes prevented the PDS partners from accomplishing the level of discourse needed for a successful partnership. Thanks, Joy. So finally, we found qualitative methods useful as a way to incorporate stakeholders who are often overlooked in evaluation designs. In our evaluation, for example, we decided to include those most impacted by the partnership, the children themselves. As a PDS, Synergy adopted pedagogical strategies meant to improve student inquiry skills and support their overall achievement. These strategies were unique to Synergy and altered the weekly schedule for students in many ways. So to understand how Synergy students experience these instructional strategies, six focus groups as fourth graders for a, a total of 29 students um, were conducted throughout the year. And also um, to be inclusive and responsive to the children's interactive ways of knowing and the varied levels of English proficiency among the Synergy youth, we decided to use an arts-based approach which allowed students to draw pictures as a way to enhance discussions of their learning experiences at Synergy. And so depicted on the slide is, is one of the um, students drawing. Great. So now given our review of how qualitative methods shaped our culturally responsive evaluation design, we would now like to discuss some key commitments of qualitative, of culturally responsive evaluators. These commitments include attending to social relations, addressing evaluator bias, and recognizing power dynamics. So we will now show how we address these particular commitments in our evaluation of the PDS partnership. Melissa is gonna start us off with the first commitment, attending to social relations. So attending to social relations in evaluation context is an important part of developing cultural responsiveness. Tineke Abma um, reminds us that social relations are an integral part of any program. First, she says, there are the social relations among program people and other stakeholders. These relations affect every aspect of the program being evaluated, um, so they have to be attended to. And as mentioned earlier, we spent numerous hours each week observing various meetings. Our frequent presence also brings up another kind of relationship Abma feels we should be mindful of. And that's the fact that the evaluation process itself is disruptive to the existing relationships within programs. Given that our evaluation was focused on documenting the developing relationships among the PDS partners, as well as between the school and the community context, we had to be attentive to how our presence affected these developing relationships. Jory will say more about another part of this effect. Related to how evaluators disrupt the social relationships that Melissa just talked about, there's another point mentioned by Abba. This point relates to addressing evaluator bias. Evaluators need to consider the values they bring to the evaluation context. As educators, Melissa and I could not help but to bring our biases about how we think schools should work. For example, we both believe that school curricula should be more open and student-centered rather than test-driven. In that way, our beliefs and values were more aligned with the university partners, creating an inherent bias in how we view the partnership. In addition, we both believe that the dislocation of families due to school rezoning created tensions at Synergy. To counter our biases, the perspectives of families and students were essential to understanding the PDS partnership. So their inclusion into our evaluation design was a very important contribution. Our point is that bias itself is neither good nor bad. It is, however, something that evaluators cannot ignore. 
finding ways to make visible our own as well as the biases of program stakeholders is something evaluators must examine and attend to. So I hope it is clear by now that all contacts are inherently political and as such display various forms of power dynamics. In their chapter on the relationship between evaluation and politics, O.B. Vestman and Ross Connor write, what makes politics a distinctive activity is that politics at its broadest concerns the production, distribution, and use of resources in the course of social existence. Politics is power, the ability to achieve a desired outcome through whatever means. What this means for culturally responsive evaluators is that they cannot ignore the politics of the context within which they work. At Synergy, Jory and I were faced with multiple and often conflicting relations of power that we needed to take into account in our design and in our interpretation. For example, an important power relationship evident from the beginning of our work was a power imbalance regarding decision making. All of the important decisions made about the school, the PDS, um, zoning, hiring of the principal, decisions regarding programming, had been made by the school district rather than the partnership. Another example of, of power that we had to attend to is how status and expertise are themselves forms of power. As evaluators who were also university professors, we were mindful of the status our position can carry and worked hard to establish trust and build relationships with teachers, administrators, parents, and students. In the end, however, we must be trusted to make fair judgments about the program given these power dynamics. The main point here is that as culturally responsive evaluators, we must find ways to work with the politics of the context. This means we understand that politics are entangled with programs. Our task is not to eliminate or ignore these political arrangements. Rather, our task is to integrate evaluation activities that actually make visible these po political arrangements within a particular context. So the key commitments of culturally responsive evaluators we have discussed, attending to social relations, addressing evaluator bias, and recognizing power dynamics can be addressed in numerous ways. Today we will talk about four possible strategies gathering a culturally responsive evaluation team, employing culturally congruent theories and methods, developing multicultural experiences, and engaging in continuous self-assessments. Jory will begin with the first one, gathering a culturally responsive evaluation team. Gathering a culturally responsive evaluation team is a charge mentioned in the American Evaluation Association Statement on Cultural Competence in Evaluation. It states, the culturally competent evaluator or evaluation team must have specific knowledge of the people and place in which the evaluation is being conducted, including local history and culturally determined mores, values, and ways of knowing. Now, in terms of our evaluation of the PDS, we were extremely fortunate to gather a team of evaluators who had different cultural histories and experiences. For example, I'm Black and have experience as a former middle school teacher in an urban context with a majority Latino population similar to that of Synergies. Melissa is white and although born in the U.S., spent her formative years in a French-speaking school. So she has some experience like the kids at Synergy, albeit quite different, with the challenge of learning a second language. In addition, our team was composed of a professor of art education and a doctoral student in gifted education, both white women. Our final team member was a Latina doctoral student in language and literacy education. Combined, the combined cultural features and areas of expertise helped us uh, to address bias and connect with a large range of stakeholders. However, gathering a culturally responsive team should not be considered sufficient in itself. 
Our point is the cultural context of any program is highly complex. Because of this, not all of the cultural characteristics of any program will be addressed by any one team or any evaluation design. Given this fact, other strategies needed to be employed. So Melissa will now discuss yet another strategy that we used. Yes, thanks. So another strategy um, we used to attend to social relations, address bias, and negotiate power dynamics was to employ culturally congruent theories and methods. This refers to one, seeking to understand how the constructs used in the evaluation are defined by the cultures identified in the evaluation. So for example, time spent at the school and in various meetings helped us identify the different ways the partnership was constructed by different stakeholders. Understanding that different versions of partnerships existed helped us better understand the issues around decision-making and the power dynamics mentioned earlier. Two, selecting appropriate theories to guide the evaluation and tailoring data collection, analysis, and interpretation to reflect stakeholders' cultures. For example, we spent time learning about PDS schools and the theories guiding their work and used this literature alongside the culturally responsive data collection strategies mentioned earlier to focus on partnership and school practices that seem relevant to both. And three, locating appropriate context within which the findings can be disseminated. So for example, a challenge we faced was building in a process for sharing our findings with different stakeholders as a way to generate dialogue. The pressure for the school to demonstra demonstrate progress as measured by student test scores meant that we were not only competing with other demands for people's times, but we were also fighting for a methodological approach that was at odds with the values of the school district in regards to showing impact. Navigating competing cultures can be a difficult part then of employing these culturally congruent approaches. Hazel Simonet, however, cautions us not to rely solely on methodological validity. While validity of instrumentation and design are important, she explains that it is more important for culturally responsive evaluators to, quote, develop intercultural and multicultural competencies, as well as an understanding that respectful evaluation practice is an ongoing process of self-development and awareness. She suggests that a big part of the process for developing cultural responsiveness is to understand that we ourselves are instruments for evaluation. So as instruments, we must be adaptive to change. This is because, as Simonet explains, culture is dynamic and ever-changing. Yesterday's culturally competent practitioner could become tomorrow's incompetent practitioner. As Melissa just illustrated, as, as qualitative evaluators, we consider ourselves an instrument. To be a culturally responsive instrument, it is imperative that we develop multicultural experiences. This is because experience from a culturally responsive stance requires that we attend responsively rather than reactively. Cultural reactivity, according to Dominica McBride, involves casting judgments without exploring alternative explanations, interacting with stakeholders without critical reflection, and taking actions without interrogating your assumptions. To be responsive to multicultural experiences, however, involves being open to alternative explanations, productively engaging social relationships by continuously examining self, team, and stakeholder assumptions. Now, in the context of our evaluation, for example, we, we needed to go to where the families lived in order to be responsive to the fact that many of them had limited transportation. Now, Melissa and I did not have a lot of experience with Latino communities. However, with this particular situation, we did recognize that despite our limited familiarity, we frankly needed to go to their neighborhood to be responsive to the families that lived there. 
we, we had to negotiate what it meant to be respectful in that context and carefully consider how we would run focus groups with Latino families without being offensive. We solicited help from the family engagement specialist at Synergy and the Latina graduate student that's on our team at the time. To be responsive, we ended up translating materials into Spanish, providing food during the focus groups, and we even offered childcare. Developing multicultural experiences is not just about engaging in diverse activities, but it involves responding to the unique circumstances of each context. And so a final strategy that we um, must employ all the time is to understand that the process of monitoring self as instrument is a continuous process of assessment of self and assessment of our design. On the latter point, although talking about documents, the suggestions made by British anthropologist Ian Hodder suggest one way of doing just that. Hodder suggests reflecting on coherence, correspondence, and fruitfulness. We have formulated three questions to assess these facets of design. So, for example, um, to assess coherence, we might ask, how well do the interpretations reflect the cultural context and connect to relevant cultural theories? For correspondence, a question might be, how well is contextual diversity and variations of perspective represented and accounted for in the findings or the report? And for fruitfulness, um, a good question might be, in what ways does the evaluation open up new understandings and perspectives on the evaluation's unique cultural context? Yes, thanks, Melissa. And so the point here is that critical reflection on evaluation coherence, correspondence, and fruitfulness work together to assess interpretations and how these interpretations were made. Qualitative evaluators have many techniques at their disposal to foster such critical reflection. In the case of our evaluation of the partnership, we used a digital recorder to capture our developing understandings of the PDS partnership. So after observing partnership meetings, Melissa and I would debrief sharing and assessing our understandings of what took place. These debriefing sessions were invaluable to interrogate varied understandings of the partnership. Also valuable to understand the institutional culture of the school and our tactics in the field. Now, as a result of these debriefings, we modified our strategies as needed to be reflexive and culturally responsive to the stakeholders. Other techniques to foster critical reflexivity include such things as memoing, using a journal or member checking. All of these techniques vary in their implementation. However, they all assume the evaluator is the data collection instrument and therefore must be subjected to continuous examinations of validity. Thanks, Joy. So um, just a few challenges, um, because even with continuous self-assessments, Culturally responsive evaluators can and do face many challenges. And here are just a few um, that um, we'll share with you today. A big one is lack of time, building relationships, changing course midway, developing and implementing culturally congruent methodologies, and engaging in continuous peer debriefings and self-assessments take time, ours as well as that of the stakeholders. And time is a shrinking commodity in most institutional settings. Another challenge um, is stakeholder resistance. Integrating culturally responsive design strategies in evaluation can be met with resistance, um, for example, because it's not seen as directly relevant to the purpose for the evaluation, or because stakeholder groups are reluctant to change their established practices, or because we as evaluators have failed to communicate an approach that makes sense to the stakeholders. And this last point makes visible another challenge to conducting culturally responsive evaluations. There is always a potential 
that an evaluation which is itself an intervention will marginalize, offend, or harm particular stakeholders in unintended ways. So another challenge is attending to these unanticipated outcomes. So the final one we'll mention today is that evaluation is about rendering a judgment. So conducting evaluations always runs the risk of negatively affecting a program, individual, or group. And as such, a challenge is considering how to render these judgments in ways that are fair, socially just, and culturally responsive. Great, thanks for outlining those challenges, Melissa. And so as we come to the end of our webinar today, we also just wanted to make mention that there are many, many resources out there related to the topic today, which is culturally responsive evaluation. These are just a few that we include on our slide presentation, which we understand will be provided to you after this webinar today. And we also want to say thank you so much for giving us your time and attention. And as I understand, we will open up for um, a little bit of Q&A. And um, on the remaining slides, just to make note, we do have a list of all of the references that we use throughout the presentation today. So we will be providing you with all of those references as well. So again, thank you so much for sharing this time with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. Let's now see if anybody has any questions. If you have questions, you may uh, click on the hand icon next to your name in the control panel, in the go to webinar control panel. Just click on the hand icon and that will tell me that uh, that will tell me that you have something to say. Uh, I do not see that you have written any questions yet. So please feel free to do so. Um, so I am uh, we are just waiting for you to raise your hands or to write down your questions and I would be we would be happy to to, to, to answer those questions. Jory and Melissa, meanwhile, while we wait for for uh, for questions, uh, would you like to add um, anything else? Um, I would just like to say that there are conferences that are now dedicated to this topic, and one of them is highlighted in our resources slide. It's called CREA, and CREA meets annually, and they have, um, it, it, is, it is a conference that is growing, and um, it started at the uh, University of Illinois, and so many of the people that we talked about in our presentation will be at CREA and feature their work and others are invited to come. So we invite folks who are interested in culturally responsive evaluation to take a look at that um, web site link provided and check it out. Okay, so uh, let's, let's, uh, let's still uh, hope that people will, will, will ask questions, anybody? Yes, we have our first question here. Uh, well, uh, no, Heidi just wanted to say thank you to you for the presentation and for sharing the slides and resources. Now, Anthony De Stefano, um, he has some questions. Let me take a look at this. Okay, do you have um, any insights on how you might have used Atlas TI or any other software to facilitate your evaluation data analysis? Anything special about the approach to analysis and evaluation that is different from research data analysis? That is a question for you to answer. Sure, I can begin, and Melissa, if uh, you have any other insights, you can definitely pick up where I left off. But I would just firstly say what comes to mind is there isn't any major differences in terms of analysis other than making a conscious decision that you will be paying attention to the things we just mentioned. So in addition to um, 
for example, the issues that might come up, you're always assessing your own role in that. And so memo memoing in Atlas TI is a great tool for keeping track of how you're feeling as an evaluator, working through a lot of the power dynamics and social relations and things that we talked about. Um, the other thing I would only add is that, and again, it's not unlike other research or evaluation, but the level of participation of the stakeholders and looking at your analysis and working with you to do the analysis, I think is something that a culturally responsive evaluator would be um, paying a lot of attention to. So for example, really considering the role that they have in the analysis and, and letting them get their hands dirty with that and allowing them to have their say in terms of how things get represented and giving up some of that power perhaps as an evaluator would be key for a culturally responsive approach to analysis. Melissa, did you have anything to add to that? Or No, I, I would uh, totally agree with um, what you said. I mean, Atlas TI um, is a useful um, uh, tool really to help you organize your data. Um, and there really isn't um, any difference except for what Jory mentioned in terms of um, really being thoughtful in terms of our stakeholders and our evaluation questions. I mean, one of the nice things also with um, the software is you can um, um, upload uh, the drawings and visual images as well, um, but those aren't, you, you know, necessarily as easy to analyze through the software um, as they might be just sitting down and looking at them. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Hui uh, Sukauskas, and my apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name well. I will open your microphone. So just a second, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, let me speak now. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. I think there's some mistake. Yes, your question, your, your microphone is open. If you have a question, I see your hand raised. Do you have a question? A, I think uh, there's uh, an error because I just want to say thank you. Ah, okay. Thank you very much for, 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 for saying that. Uh, You're welcome. So I'm going to close your microphone now. And uh, anybody else would like to uh, ask a question or make a comment? Just raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon uh, next to your name. And in fact, uh, I have another one from Lara. Um, let me see if I can give the microphone to Lara. Uh, it's always good to hear people's voices. Lara, go ahead. Oh, hello. Um, I was just wondering if you could recommend one or two books that covered some of the material in today's lecture. Thank you, Lara. So the question was if you could recommend uh, one or two books on the material uh, presented today. Laura, can you see um, the, um, the PowerPoint here? Yes, we can see it. We can all see it. Okay, I was trying to find a reference for the text. Um, but essentially there is an updated um, textbook on culturally responsive evaluation um, that we drew from. And I'm happy to share that with you and give you the exact reference. I'm not noticing it on our slide, but um, it has the Dominica McBride, um, here it is, the 2015, I don't know if you can see the slide, references continued. But this book, her chapter is cited in when we went through reactivity and cultural, cultural responsiveness. Hood, Hobson, Ferrison, um, continuing the journey to reposition culture and cultural context in evaluation theory and practice. I think that's an excellent um, collection of chapters on this topic. And so it's fairly recent, as you can see, 2015, that's the other advantage of this text that so you have very recent um, writings on this topic. They do have an earlier version, but this is the second edition, I believe, or the, the second time that these authors have gotten together to really 
critically engage um, cultural responsiveness. And Hood, incidentally, the first um, um, person here on the book listing Stafford Hood is the same person who does the CREA evaluation um, conference that I mentioned earlier. So these, again, are some of the folks that we highlighted throughout the presentation. Thank you so much. That's a great question. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let's wait for another question to come in. Anybody else? We still, still have a few more minutes left. Let me see, let me see. Nobody is, is, is asking questions today. Maybe it's too early. <laughs> in the morning. In the morning. It, was so, it was so thorough. <laughs> well, I remember when I used to teach at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, my students would never ask me any questions. <laughs> uh, okay, let me see. Uh, meanwhile, Yvette, would you like to say something about the, the, the events that are coming up uh, at I, IQM? Sure. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, IIQM next month in June, we're hosting our Thinking Qualitatively th uh, workshop series. So we're going to have over 40 workshops, qualitative and skills-based workshops, taking place here at Edmonton, Alberta. So you can go to the website um, iaqm.ualberta.ca and check out um, those workshops and register for them. And we also have our qual our um, Qualitative Health Research Conference coming up in October, and so Abstract Submission is open for that as well. And the, we are accepting abstracts until the end of May. So just a few weeks left to submit your abstracts for that conference. Uh, Yvette, uh, what is the next, uh, and what and when is the next presentation uh, that is part of this webinar series? Um, next month on June 8th at 4 p.m., um, Mountain Daylight Time, we have Gil Westorp. So the registration for that should be up soon on the website. And, and you also have a very interesting webinar series on mixed methods research, right? Uh, yes, and that the next um, installment of that will actually takes place tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m. and that's with Peggy Shannon Baker and she'll be speaking on applications of mixed methods research and education. So again, you can go to the um, website iqm.uabrata.ca and register for that webinar which takes place tomorrow. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Yvette. Now, uh, there is a question from, from Anthony, the Stefano. And Anthony, let me, let me share, uh, let me open your microphone. Perhaps you could ask that question on your own. Uh, your microphone is open now. Hi, thank you so much for the, the great training. Um, I was just wondering if you had a theory that uh, tended to frame your approach to evaluation uh, beyond just, you know, uh, culturally responsive. Do you, do you have any theories or that have tended to dovetail well with, with this approach? Thank you, Anthony. Um, I, yes, actually, I'll, I, um, I'll, I'll take this one and then Melissa, if you have a thought, you can chime in okay. as well. So one of the um, major theories that I use is um, values engaged approach. Um, and it started off as a theory that was used to be culturally responsive in the context of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, because as we know, oftentimes there are groups that um, don't fare well in those particular fields. And so that has its own unique framework. And so um, it fo focuses on, for example, curriculum, pedagogy, and, and equity is at the center of that. And I've written with um, Jennifer Green on that topic, it's values engaged approach to evaluation. And that's a particular kind of culturally responsive approach. And there's there's numerous others. So that would be the one I would say. Melissa, do you have anything? Um, yeah, that's that's a, a, a good a good question also. Um, so another um, theory that has guided our work um, and, and Joy and I have an article on that is um, 
you know, thinking about evaluation as a, as a practice, and so practice-oriented um, evaluation. And, and kind of this approach is actually informed by um, philosophical hermeneutics, which is a theory of meaning-making and engagement and participation uh, in meaning making, so that um, so those those two theories might be some an interesting place for you to go, um, you know, and look and see what's been done. Thank you very much. I do not see that we have any questions, any more questions from the audience. Uh, so um, we are getting close to the end as well. So why don't we do this, uh, Yvette? Would you like to say a few a few last words, and then I will let the presenters also. Say a, a, a few last words. I just want to thank um, Dr. Hall and Dr. Freeman for being with us here today and giving us that great presentation. And thank you to everyone for attending. Okay, thank and you. Hopefully. Yes, go ahead. Would you like to say, Jory and Melissa, a few last words? Thank you again so much for joining us today. And uh, we greatly appreciate any feedback you have to offer. Thank you very much, uh, Jody, and thank you very much, Melissa, for the presentation. Uh, also, everybody else, I sent to you through chat the, the, the link to the IIQM website where you will find the two programs that Yvette mentioned. Uh, well, this one uh, on qualitative met methodology, as well as the webinar series in uh, mixed methods research. So thank you, uh, Jory Hall uh, and Melissa Freeman from University of Georgia. And thank you, everybody else, for coming today. And thank you, Yvette, as well. Uh, goodbye now. And by the way, you're going to be receiving in a few hours uh, the, um, the, the, the link to the video of this presentation. And if you go to the website of IIQM, uh, you will be able to find there the PowerPoint that was shown today. Uh, but I think that is going to be available uh, maybe in a few days from now. So give it up until Friday, I would say. Thank you, all of you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye-bye.